Chapter Three of Bushido, the Soul of Japan. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Hawaii in November two thousand and nine. Bushido, the Soul of Japan by Inazo Nitobe. Chapter Three, Rectitude or Justice. To the pervading characteristics of the men of whom Monsieur de la Mazelière writes, let us now address ourselves. I shall begin with rectitude or justice, the most cogent precept in the code of the samurai. Nothing is more loathsome to him than underhand dealings and crooked undertakings. The conception of rectitude may be erroneous, it may be narrow. A well-known bushi defines it as a power of resolution. Rectitude is the power of deciding upon a certain course of conduct in accordance with reason without wavering to die when it is right to die to strike when to strike is right another speaks of it in the following terms rectitude is the bone that gives firmness and stature as without bones the head cannot rest on the top of the spine nor hands move nor feet stand so without rectitude neither talent nor learning can make of a human frame a samurai with it the lack of accomplishments is as nothing Mencius calls benevolence man's mind, and rectitude or righteousness his path. How lamentable, he exclaims, is it to neglect the path and not pursue it, to lose the mind and not know to seek it again. But men's fowls and dogs are lost, they know to seek for them again, but they lose their mind and do not know to seek for it. Have we not here, as in a glass darkly, a parable propounded three hundred years later in another clime and by a greater teacher who called himself the way of righteousness through whom the lost could be found but i stray from my point righteousness according to mencius is a straight and narrow path which a man ought to take to regain the lost paradise even in the latter days of feudalism, when the long continuance of peace brought leisure into the life of the warrior class, and with it dissipations of all kinds and gentle accomplishments, the epithet Gishi, a man of rectitude, was considered superior to any name that signified mastery of learning or art. The forty-seven faithfuls, of whom so much is made in our popular education, are known in common parlance as the forty-seven Gishi. In times when cunning artifice was liable to pass for military tact and downright falsehood for ruse de guerre, this manly virtue, frank and honest, was a jewel that shone the brightest and was most highly praised. Rectitude is a twin brother to valor, another martial virtue. But before proceeding to speak of valor, let me linger a little while on what I may term a derivation from rectitude, which, at first deviating slightly from its original, became more and more removed from it, until its meaning was perverted in the popular acceptance. I speak of giri, literally the right reason, but which came in time to mean a vague sense of duty which public opinion expected an incumbent to fulfill. In its original and unalloyed sense, it meant duty, pure and simple. Hence, we speak of the giri we owe to parents, to superiors, to inferiors, to society at large, and so forth. In these instances, giri is duty. For what else is duty than what right reason demands and commands us to do? Should not right reason be our categorical imperative? Giri primarily meant no more than duty, and I dare say its etymology was derived from the fact that in our conduct, say to our parents, though love should be the only motive, lacking that, there must be some other authority to enforce filial piety, and they formulated this authority in giri. Very rightly did they formulate this authority, giri, since if love does not rush to deeds of virtue, recourse must be had to man's intellect and his reason must be quickened to convince him of the necessity of acting aright. The same is true of any other moral obligation. The instant duty becomes onerous. Right reason steps in to prevent our shirking it. Giri, thus understood, is a severe taskmaster, with a birch rod in his hand to make sluggards perform their part. It is a secondary power in ethics. As a motive, it is infinitely inferior to the Christian doctrine of love, which should be the law. 
I deem it a product of the conditions of an artificial society, of a society in which accident of birth and unmerited favor constituted class distinctions, in which the family was the social unit, in which seniority of age was of more account than superiority of talents, in which natural affections had often to succumb before arbitrary man-made customs. Because of this very artificiality, Giri in time degenerated into a vague sense of propriety called upon to explain this and sanction that, as, for example, why a mother must, if need be, sacrifice all her other children in order to save the firstborn, or why a daughter must sell her chastity to get funds to pay for the father's dissipation, and the like. Starting as right reason, Giri has, in my opinion, often stooped to casuistry. It has even degenerated into cowardly fear of censure. I might say of Giri what Scott wrote of patriotism, that, as it is the fairest, so it is often the most suspicious, mask of other feelings. Carried beyond or below right reason, Giri became a monstrous misnomer. It harbored under its wings every sort of sophistry and hypocrisy. It might easily have been turned into a nest of cowardice, if Bushido had not a keen and correct sense of courage, the spirit of daring and bearing, to the consideration of which we shall now return. End of chapter 3